and welcome to our 27th Open Clock Club. We nearly started on time tonight, so a bit of a miracle. Anyway, good to see you all, as always, as usual. And uh, yeah, welcome. Beautiful, sunny day here in York. And it's a bank holiday weekend, so everybody's in the holiday mood. And um, yeah, so... Uh, Remember, these uh, sessions are recorded. They go on our YouTube archive channel. So um, we would love to hear from you. We like to see your faces. Um, but if you want to remain anonymous, then remember to keep your camera turned off. So um, it, we were just chatting before we went live on air. And, um, you know, I realized that it's probably quite irritating sometimes because I say, right next week we're going to do this thing and then I forgot and go off on a tangent and something else happens so if you're really looking forward to a thing that I've said I'm going to do the secret is to uh, drop us a line through Facebook uh, on Friday <laughs> to remind me what I said I was going to do uh, so we've got a few things to tackle uh, this evening um, not least of which is the incredibly exciting news that well, I just need to move that so I can see. Incredibly exciting news that our um, depthing and bushing book uh, pamphlet thing is now in its second final draft format. So we are keeping everything. It's going to be a busy weekend. Oh, this Ian. Busy weekend uh, going through this, finding out all the typos, and hopefully it'll be uh, available next week on... KDP. And we think because it's actually kind of a book, it's 60 pages now, we're considering it's going to be part of book two, which is based on two train uh, Enfield. But we're also wondering whether we should publish it as, um, as a book uh, standalone thing as well. And we know that we've struggled and continue to struggle to get our book one to the States. But if we did this, it would be a uh, perfect bounce. So it would be a heck of a lot easier to find a, a printer in the States and do it that way. Anyway, that's enough self-promotion, but that's the thing that's given us all bags under the eyes at the moment, uh, getting that sorted out. So um, there we are, little French clock to, uh, to look at. Uh, this is kind of going to be our main uh, subject this week. And it's about pendulum length. You might remember two or three weeks ago, we had uh, an inquiry through Facebook for somebody who had bought a clock. It had no pallets and it had no pendulum. And they said, how do we dis go about designing the pallets? So we covered that. And then we kind of got a bit up to here with uh, theory or half my half baked theory. So we had a week off from it. But we're going to go back to the second part of that uh, question, which is a, a much more common question. I bought a clock, we had it again this week, um, and either the, it's got the wrong pendulum with it, or it's got no pendulum with it. And the question is something like, how do I know uh, how long a pendulum it should have? Now, um, uh, Ian, I think it was, very, very kindly pointed out that um, these clocks, I'm not actually going to talk about this just yet, but I'll, I'll get as warmed up. These clocks uh, have very, very conveniently gotten the theoretical pendulum length stamped on the bottom of the plate often. So this is 4.8 French inches. So avoir de poids inches, I think. So that's kind of quite useful. You can soon uh, calculate that in millimeters. Uh, however, most clocks don't have that. So uh, particularly for pre sort of industrial clocks as in not machine made ones you've got to figure it out and i'm going to show you how to do that um because it's it's kind of quite easy if you uh, uh and quite good fun if you like math and math is like my worst fear so um you're gonna have to uh, bear with us on that one however first there's this um animal here now you may remember we tried <laughs> last week i went to put the clock in in the case and when I came to wound it, found that the mainspring is not hooked on the uh, the outer hooking here, which of course is a complete sort of um, schoolboy beginner error. And when we uh, look at the spring, 
And I think this is maybe a function as well. The, the spring was cracked. I kind of all, they all came flooding back. The spring was cracked. So we cut the end off, made a new end in it. And I thought I'd kind of push the spring out so it would hook on, but it didn't hook on. And then, of course, the problem with that is once you wind it, then the spring spins around inside the barrel and it damages the end of the spring and it damages the inside of the barrel, which is if you've got um, a, like a VUC clock or something with quite a shallow hooking can really be quite dangerous uh, and quite damaging. And also, of course, if you put a really, it didn't really matter here because this clock takes about two minutes to get it apart. But if you've got a really complicated clock and you discover at the end that the spring isn't hooked on, it's a real pain. Now, I suppose it would be... Um, really more useful if I was using one of those mainspring winders with the concentric steel sleeves. And this is a question we get asked lots, uh, which mainspring winder should I buy? In the book, um, we show you to use this one, or we demonstrate using this one, but we do point out this kind of traditional type, that it's not the most safe way to do it for beginners. So when we re, uh, print that book, we're going to get a couple more winders with the concentric steel sleeves, the uh, so-called Ollie Baker type, and maybe the Bergeon one as well, and do some comparisons. And of course, that would have helped here. I don't you I've never used one of those, but presumably you can tell that the, uh, I don't want to get oil on there, you can tell that the spring's not hooked on because um, there's a tab of the spring sticking out. So but if you can just see down in there, there's the end of the spring and it is not hooked on the, uh, the hooking. And because the hooking's visible, I should have known better. Anyway, I didn't, uh, maybe I'll never learn, but <laughs> there you go. So of course, what I did do was to check that the um, spring was hooked on by giving it a bit of a wind, which is a nice idea, but I didn't wind it enough. So let's just have a, I might just put a thicker glove on because I'm a little bit um, cautious about this. So I'm going to just get that spring out and um, show you what's happened to it. Then I'll put it back, but I won't bother with all the boring stuff this week. I'll clean it during the week and then next week we can actually get the clock. So there we are. And if you can see in there, let's just put it around there so you can actually, there's the hooking. So what I did was of course I wound the spring a little bit like this and thought, that's great, it's fine. But um, it wasn't because it, uh, I don't think I can do this actually by hand, it's quite tricky. This is the problem, it took three or four winds. Don't see, it's actually got hooked on now. I've been fiddling about with it. Don't think so. Let's just have a look. That was a problem anyway. It wasn't until I actually had the, the ratchet uh, mechanism on, started winding it up, but then after about three or four winds, I heard it slipping round. At first, I thought it was just the spring um, getting, uh, sort of settling down, but it wasn't. And so I had to, as always, admit defeat and, um, and go on from there. So we've got a bit of a... Um, I did actually... No, it's definitely not. It's definitely not hooked on. It's about a quarter of the way around. Um, so it just shows you've really got to test that it's hooked on properly, particularly if the hooking is not um, visible like this from the outside. But a uh, little exercise for you. I've um, got two exercises today. In fact, we're going to have a bit of homework for next week, um, particularly if you are not confident with math, which I'm, as I said, I'm not confident with math. I've got some homework coming up. Uh, that you can work on during the week. But the work now is uh, earlier on today, we had a question on Facebook, somebody beginning uh, in our um, book, there's a tool list in the back, but they um, said, what do I need to get started? Another interesting um, question, another interesting comment, really sweet comment from somebody was the fact that they really like the fact that we don't suck through our teeth and say, if you don't have this lathe and this milling machine and this thing, you can't start in clock making. So it's nice to get people started. So on the live chat, which is the most important part of these meetings, um, when you're ready, any, um, any minute now, tell us 
if you were a beginner or you're advising a beginner, what three tools do you get first? So that's not sort of a, like a um, camera or notebook, the things that you might already have, but what three horological tools would you get first? Um, I'm just going to get the spring out in a minute, but just um, talking about uh, tools, here are some uh, really nice posh Swiss tweezers. And here are some, I lose these, I don't know why they disappear to, um, brass tweezers, which are really great. And they're about 10 times the cost. And this is always interesting. I do eventually have my files uh, video coming out where I've got testing files and one file is 10 times the price of the other. So I think these brass tweezers, they're three pounds a pair, are, um, are really good. So um, yeah, there's a typical tool. I would, would I put this on my list? I haven't actually thought about it, but anyway, Team Open Clock Club is waiting there for your uh, answers to that. And at the end, we'll compile all the answers and then next week we will come back to you with the top three tools. So what are the top three horological tools you would advise a beginner to buy? I think brass tweezers are maybe on that list. Anyhow, so if you've got a spring like this, either it hasn't hooked on or a spring that's broken near the outer end, how do you get it out of the barrel? Now, um, if it's broken at the outer end, if it's broken uh, and you, it isn't near the inner end, you might think, well, I'll just yank it out with a pair of pliers uh, because I'm going to have to replace that spring anyway. Well, maybe, but, you know, springs can be uh, reholed at both ends um, of the hooking. And uh, so there isn't really a neat way to do it, I'm afraid, that I can think of anyway. It's all a little bit brutal. So I'm going to move across to the main spring winder. And all I can think to do in this case is to wind the spring. And normally the end of the spring would be uh, visible. I'd grab it with my pliers hold it, take the barrel off and release it. And that would be great. I can't do that in this case because it's never going to generate that space to get the pliers in. So I think all I can do is just kind of wind it until it comes out of the barrel. What would what would you do, I suppose, is the question. So as always... What made the brass tweezers did Alan is asking? Uh, the posh ones are ASCO, A-S-C-O, they're Swiss. Um, I think they maybe make the springs a branded version because... As far as I understand, Bergeon isn't a manufacturer. They just rebrand everybody else's stuff. Nothing wrong with that, of course. Um, but if you go on the ASCO website, uh, you can see they've got lots of different... These are bronze. They've got brass and bronze tweezers. Really nice. But they're about £30, I think. Uh, these ones, they're unbranded. I bought them from H.S. Walsh. But you can buy them... Um, anyway, and they're, they're, I think they're really nice. They're tapered. Uh, they've got decent, strong tips. I would say they're perfect for clock making. In, um, I remember when we started all those years ago, one of the tests, one of the things we did was make a pair of tweezers. And one of the tests was if you pick up your tweezers, pick up something with your tweezers like this, um, when you squeeze them really tight, does the thing fly out? And you should be able to rotate a little bit unfair in this case, because it's a big component, but a small component like that. So these are great. Three pounds, really uh, good value for money. Um, right. So let's get this out. I don't know any neat way of doing it, I'm afraid. So I'm going to put my safety gloves on and my goggles. That's my other glove. I'm going to get the spring out. And because I've wound it uh, several times, um, there's going to be a bit of brass kind of swarf inside there. So it's not going to be pretty. So not massively um, happy about this. But there you go. That, I should have tested it first. So there's the, there's the lesson. So it's going to move the camera a bit across here. One day we'll have three cameras. We will have vice cam, um, we'll have desk cam, and we'll have lathe cam, but we haven't at the moment. So let's just see if that's going to focus. Move that junk out of the way. So I'm just going to check that it's in the 
There we are. So all I can do here is really wind the spring. And you're not going to be able to see this, I'm afraid, because it's uh, I can't do it like this. I need to cover it. You can see what I'm going to do. I'm going to just continue to wind the spring. Now, it might be that if we've got our fingers crossed that the spring hooks on, if I push down like this, it might be that it hooks on, uh, but I'm not counting on that. So just got my, as I said, safety gloves, safety glasses, good, strong cloth. And if the worst happens, then um, the spring will fly out, but it will be contained by this. And I'm just going to continue to wind the spring and try and get the um, Right, okay. So you can see starting to uh, come out with the barrel there, which is what we want. Um, just before I forget, there's a whole lot of, um, you know, one of those rules of thumb, which I would totally avoid, that says if the spring is kind of being pulled out sometime by some somebody, and it's kind of conical when it's on the bench, I'll see if I can find one in the comfort break. They say that spring has had it and you should throw it away. I totally don't believe that at all. And I'll show you why um, that uh, to me has got nothing to do with chucking the spring away. I'm a big fan of keeping old springs, but anyway. So this is really quite gruesome. Not coming out at all. what not to do. Right, I think we're going to be there. Maybe not the best thing to do on air, actually. Don't do it live on air. Eric says he's pulled the centre, he has pulled the centre out of one bone with leather gloves on. Yeah. I mean, which is essentially what I'm doing here, isn't it? Just, um, and it might leave the spring a little bit uh, conical, I don't know. It's not pretty. But hopefully my thing is your game. So let's just let that down. Gosh. Mm, right. Oh, well, not very happy about that, but uh, let's just have a look why that happened. We'll put the camera back because we're going to need it across there anyway. So. So as if it's done quickly, it the spring. Yeah, I um I think that's an interesting point about the spring. So we can see there inside the barrel, the spring's been rubbing on the hooking here. So certainly let's just focus a bit. Not ideal. Um but more importantly, or more relevant, should I say, let's have a look here. Right, okay. Now I kind of hadn't um, noticed that when I put it in, I was maybe over uh, overexcited, is that um, you can see the spring's got a bend in it here. So what that's been doing is it's been pushing the hooking uh, out of the way. Now, got to be a little bit careful about that, that it hasn't cracked. Not quite sure. Um, maybe that was with my pliers. I don't know. Slightly dodgy. So I'm going to have to have a close look at that. But obviously, if you want any part of the spring to be higher, it needs to be this bit here where it hooks on. So in fact, it needs to be shaped like that. So it actually encourages it to hook on. Certainly not uh, bent there. 
anyway, I'm going to have a look at that during the week. And um, obviously it needs cleaning again. I need to clean the barrel, get all the brass uh, dust out of there. Not very pretty. So the moral of the story is make sure that the spring is hooked on. Uh, check, check and check again. Otherwise you'll end up in a mess like that. Um, I will have a look for a, a spring, but not just at the moment. We'll get onto our um, calculation first. So, yeah, um, if, I mean, it looks like the spring's quite flat. So as much as that looked really terrible, which it wasn't uh, something I was particularly proud of, the spring kind of hasn't gone into a cone. Nevertheless, if it had, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Uh, as I say, it's, it's one of those things that people say, oh, it must be thrown away if it's like that, but um, I don't believe it at all. Right, okay, let's get that out of the way. It, that's not my MFS. Okay, so pendulum length, a bit of math. Now, um, I'm gonna focus. So here's the pendulum that relates to this clock. We saw it stamped at the bottom here, 4.8 .8 French inches, and the pendulum bob is stamped accordingly. It's always a nice way of um, reasonably, it's got the number on the back, no, of uh, telling whether a, a pendulum with a French clock is the sort of original pendulum to the clock. Sometimes they have the serial number or part of the serial number uh, as well. Now, there's a couple of things here before we get started on our calculation, and that is what do you mean by pendulum length? When we do the calculation, um, what we'll end up with is a theoretical length, but that has, well, obviously it's got something to do with the actual length of the pendulum, but um, you have to take it with a pinch of salt. So we've got two things here that are important. One is the center of mass of the pendulum or the kind of center of gravity of the pendulum. And the other one is a center of oscillation. So the center of mass, we can get an idea of where that is, a rough idea by balancing it on something, just happen to have our um, brass tweezers here. And we can see that the center of um, uh, mass of the pendulum somewhere about there, it's kind of balanced, let's call it there, is not the length of the pendulum. The pendulum is always, I think, going to be actually longer than that, but that does relate more closely to our theoretical length. The next thing, and really something that's much more important beyond this idea about math and calculation if your clock doesn't have a pendulum, of course, what you could do is just get a really long pendulum and shorten it or a short pendulum, pendulum and lengthen it. Um, but let's have a look at the pendulum spring, the suspension spring, because that is actually really, really uh, useful information and relevant outside this question of if you've got a clock that doesn't have a spring. I don't want to move up to go on the deck. So um, this, remember when we uh, start our pendulum clock going, we wind it up, hopefully the spring's hooked on, the main spring, and um, take your eye off the adjustable spanner collection. Um, off uh, the, the, the pendulum's hanging still, and we have to put energy into the system to get it started. So we displace the pendulum from its point of rest, and we let it go, it starts swinging, and the escapement or the main spring, the motive power, replaces that lost energy all well and good. The complication there in relation to the spring, this is given that you've got um, a suspension, a pendulum that's suspended by a spring and not a pivoted uh, pendulum or a knife edge, that the spring plays a big part, the suspension spring this is, in the restoring force. So effectively adding, he said rather loosely, sorry, any physicists out there, adding to the value of gravity. So if you imagine your pendulum's at the point of rest, if that pendulum's got a really strong spring, when you let go of it, it's gonna reach the center, the point of rest, quicker than it would if it were just under the influence of gravity alone. So hence my kind of effectively adding 
to gravity. Now, you might think, well, what the heck has this got to do with anything, Matthew? Well, it's got something to do with the fact that, uh, particularly on fusey dial clocks, um, where often the pendulum bob is, we did actually have somebody with this problem, can't remember who it was, where the pendulum bob or the rating nut is really close to the bottom of the case. And they've let the pendulum down, let the pendulum down and can't let it down anymore. And it's like the biggest mystery. And the answer is the first place I would look at, I mean, it might be that we had this week on the Facebook group that the pendulum or the movement's got nothing to do with that case. But with the fusey clocks, I would look at the suspension spring because if the suspension spring is stronger or too strong, if you like, then basically your pendulum has got a shorter period than it would have normally. And the only way you can get around that is by regulating it out. So making the pendulum longer and longer and longer accordingly. And if the case is in the way, you get stuck. So you will come across that if you hang around in the world of clocks. And um, these aren't French clock springs, but these are just, uh, what are they? Um, mantle clock springs. This has got two blades that doesn't make a whole lot of difference. All the two blades does is that it gives you more stability. So it prevents the pendulum from weaving. What's critical here, two dimensions, the width of the spring is important, but the restoring force is proportional to the width. So if you double the width, you double the restoring force. Um, so you can get away with quite a bit of difference before you notice a big difference in the timekeeping. The two values that are more critical are the length of the spring, in this case, the working length of the spring, and importantly, the thickness of the spring. And this is exactly the same. This is why I bang on about replacement mainspring so much, because the strength of the spring is proportional to the cube of the thickness and the length are inversely proportional to the length. So if you change the thickness of a spring a bit, it'll make a big difference to the timekeeping um, because you've got more or less restoring force. So that, if I do say my, so, so myself, probably poorly explained, but really important bit of information if you ever find yourself in that situation where you can't regulate the clock because you've run out of um, rating thread either way, too short or too long. It might be that your suspension spring thickness um, is at fault. Okay, so in the case of our French clock here, uh, we we know that the center of uh, gravity of the spring of the pendulum is somewhere down here, but where is the center of oscillation? Because it's between those two points that we have our theoretical length. And the problem with the spring is let's just get a length of spring out of here. Right. Okay. Uh, that's a good point. So uh, Derek, who's um, our specialist in uh, torsion pendulum clocks, says exactly the same thing happens there. And um, so the thickness of the spring is really critical. Don't think, oh, you know, I don't know how thick this is. Let's measure it, shall we? Um, break the habit of a lifetime. Let's say it's point, um, one, two, uh, for instance. Cube that, and then let's say we've got one that's point 0.1 cubed that, point 0.1 cubed is, uh, well, one cubed is one. Um, and you will see that there's a lot of difference. So a little bit of difference in thickness. So this is 1.3 something thick. And it would be ever so easy on a tall case clock or something like this to say, oh, I've got one that's one point four or 1.1 or something and think that's going to be good enough. It might be on a long case clock, but the reality is on a, on a mantle clock, which most of us deal with most of the time, it makes a big difference. So yeah, 1.35, something like that. So when you're measuring uh, main spring, uh, suspension springs, then you want to be down in that point, uh, less, you know, less than point zero one kind of uh, territory in terms of the uh, accuracy of your measurement. And you will probably get away with a digital caliper, which I'd normally use, but I've lost. But actually, 
um, bench micrometer can become incredibly useful or even one of those um, dial micrometers, uh, which um, are a really good investment. These actually are incredibly cheap. Um, micrometers are uh, very, very little money. Right. Anyway, the point I was going to make was that when the spring bends, you don't have a distinct point that you can say that's the center of oscillation. If we take a French clock spring, get in the box. Usually you open these boxes and they're the wrong way up and all the contents get mixed up. But... So here's our French clock spring. Let's just put it on a white background so you can see. You can note, you'll notice that when we uh, deflect the spring, it doesn't bend in any particular um, focus place. In fact, as the pendulum swings backwards and forwards, the point of um, the center of oscillation actually moves up and down a little bit. And the only way you can calculate this, uh, well, you, it's really difficult to calculate out of my league, I'm afraid, is uh, to regulate the thing out, but at least we can get in the ballpark. So there we are, center of oscillation and uh, center of mass of the pendulum, two kind of concepts to keep in the back of your mind. Now, those really clever people who run the NAWCC uh, horological science um, chapter, if any of you are interested in getting into the math of this thing, then they are the people to answer the questions. Really cool people. I think when they make uh, their super high precision clocks, they make the effective length of the pendulum, this uh, uh, suspension spring very short for this reason to focus that point of oscillation. And I also think they make it very thin to, um, to uh, get around this restoring force thing without going on. Another thing relating to Dell's torsion pendulum, which we don't really have to worry about in, uh, in pendulum clocks like the ones that we typically work on, but uh, we do have to with the put ten, uh, torsion clocks and with uh, chronometers and watches, of course, is the fact that the spring, like this, a bit of carbon steel, changes its um, uh, coefficient of elasticity with a change in temperature. So um, if the spring gets hotter, it gets floppier, so it's got less, um, uh, less restoring force. So rather like a pendulum clock where the pendulum gets longer in heat, a watch with a carbon steel spring will run slower as well in heat and vice versa, which is why um, torsion pendulum clocks are um, made out of, uh, suspensions are made out of Elinvar, I think, which is, um, yeah, Elinvar. Yeah. Fiddling with the storage bits have a proportionally smaller effect when you start dealing with the much heavier pendulums and have long case clocks. Uh, I would, um, so the question from Wolfie, it's a good question, completely out of my depth, is when you deal with clocks with a heavier pendulum, does the a change in restoring force of the suspension spring have a proportionately smaller effect on the, on the rate? I'm going to say no, um, because as we'll see next week, the period of a pendulum is um, is independent of mass. So my gut reaction, and if anybody out there is in, uh, is into physics, then please put me right on that. I could be 100% totally wrong. So I'd say no, it doesn't have uh, a proportionally smaller effect. Um, I'd have to think about that. And also ask somebody who actually knows about physics. A good question though. I mean, it's when we, replace the suspension spring on a grandfather clock, a long, a tall case clock, you know, you kind of do just pull something out of the bag um, and 0 0.1, 0 0.11, 0 0.12. And those springs tend to be um, sort of a, a standard thing. I mean, in fact, you can buy them, can't you, from material suppliers. So there's a little, if anybody's got a suspension spring, you know, one of those off the peg ones, from a, a fusy dial clock or a, a long case clock that you buy from the material suppliers, it would be really cool if you could rush off and measure it. 
and uh, find out how thick that is off the peg. Good question. I think uh, it's another one of those things where we need to do some experimentation. Okay, so slightly uh, hectic as always. Let's just stop this thing from. Okay. Yeah. It says a heavier pendulum would have a greater momentum, so it would change direction less readily. So I would expect a strong spring. So would I expect a strong spring? Spring. Strong spring like a heavier pendulum would have greater momentum, so it would change direction less readily. It would if you were, so the question uh, was, and again, out of my depth on the physics totally, the question was that a heavier pendulum has got greater momentum. I think if you were changing the spring as the clock was running, that would uh, matter. Um, you know, if you could somehow magically change the thickness of the spring as you were going along, as the clock was running, that would make a difference. But remember, we're in this in effectively a state of equilibrium where the pendulum's got the same amount of energy coming in has been lost so the amplitude remains the same once it's settled once it's settled down uh yeah out, out of my depth but i don't know whether john's here today he's um he's a physics teacher and his dad is a physicist so we can have a good old chew on that throughout the week how are we doing on the changing the subject to something that's a bit more within my comfort zone what, how are we doing on the uh, tools? Lots, lots of good answers. Lots of good lots answers. Good range. Um, right. I'm going to put them on a spreadsheet. All right. Has anybody said Shaoblin one or two is an essential tool for the beginner? <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> oh, joking. No, no, I don't. I'm not allowed. Right. Okay. So reset our brains. We've got our clock from, let's say we've got it from eBay, but any other place doesn't have a pendulum. Completely sort of regular question. How on earth do we figure out what the theoretical length of the pendulum is going to be? Bearing in mind those two points that I've just made, that there is a difference between the theoretical length and the actual length. So here's how you do it. We're going to just go with a regular clock that's got a center wheel with a minute hand on it. It's got a, what we uh, call uh, the third wheel or more nowadays the upper intermediate wheel. I think that third wheel thing's fallen out of fashion. And then an escape wheel. So we've got three wheels in our train here and i know people might say well you, you can get this thing which i think is really useful called the clock beat book or something like that but that doesn't help us with clocks that were made before um standardization so you can't kind of look up what the uh, train is so um here is to make sure i'm on the screen i'm running the camera on the other side but i'll move around so here's our center wheel so there are two ways of going about this. If, like me, it's really useful to do a diagram, uh, which I think it is for a lot of clocks people, I don't know, then this is the first way to do it. Once I've done it this way, I'll show you how you can just do it in a relatively straightforward formula as well. So here's our um, axle, or arbor, as we call it. And on the end of the arbor, we've got a minute hand. And we know, um, in this case anyway, uh, that this wheel, or this mobile makes one revolution per 60 minutes. One, I'll call it one revolution per hour. Okay, uh, all good there. Um, in our clock, this is like a Smith's Enfield and I'm sure a lot of American clocks, tall case clocks are exactly the same. Our second meshing mobile has got uh, a pinion and it's got uh, third wheel here. So this wheel meshes with this pinion. Uh, sharing that arbor is another wheel. This is the upper intermediate wheel or the third wheel. And that wheel meshes with our second pinion, which in this case has got our escape wheel on it. Uh, so I'll just label those. So we've got a label them right across uh, here. So center third, third escape. So we know that uh, this is rotating clockwise as we look at the front in this case. So this one rotates counterclockwise and this one rotates clockwise. Okay, that's all we need. We've got our three wheels. We need to know 
uh, this thing called train count, which John explains in the book. We need to know the number of uh, teeth on those three wheels and the number of leaves on these two pinions. And then we're laughing. So I'll just draw in some palettes up here, just so we know what that is. Here's our palette arbor. And critically, here's our pendulum hanging down here. And this is the question. We want to know what the length of our oops, pendulum is. Move that out the way. We want to know what the length of our pendulum is for those wheels. So here's your homework, right? Everybody listening, you might need a pen and paper. Um, I want you to do this exercise. If you, I mean, obviously, if you're good with maths, and uh, really kind of uh, engineering and that thing, then you don't, you can do it in your head. But if you're new to this, it's really useful. You'll thank me one day, honestly. I want you to do this exercise. So get a bit of pen, get a bit of paper and a pen and write down your center wheel, third wheel and pinion, escape wheel and pinion, and put some numbers on there, made up numbers. Uh, I mean, clock ratios are typically eight to one, nine to one, 10 to one, something like that. But just put made up numbers on there and you're gonna figure out during the week what your pendulum length is gonna be. Then you've done it, it's, it's there, for, there forever. You will thank me, I think anyway. So here are our numbers, not entirely made up. One thing to warn you about this is don't worry if you get crazy numbers at the end. Obviously count three times and check your calculation. But things like, um, I think Ian is, is Ian's with us tonight. Yeah, Ian uh, has uh, shown us a couple of his uh, long case clocks on Facebook, which is really kind of him. Now, those clocks appear to have seconds pendulums, but because they don't have seconds dial, seconds indication, you'll often find that for whatever reason, the pendulum is a little bit longer, a little bit shorter than a second. It doesn't matter. And I'm sure there's somebody in this group that's got one of those German weight-driven wall clocks that we uh, used to call Vienna regulators, but they're not called that anymore. Um, and it's got a seconds hand on it that goes around in about 45 seconds. So don't get obsessed by kind of integer numbers on this whole thing. Right, so let's put some numbers on our bit of paper. So our centre wheel, which is here, we're gonna give that 80 four teeth. Yeah, our I've done I've, I did a bit of practice, so I'm just copying my uh, crib sheet. Our third wheel pinion with which it's engaging, so those two are linked together. Has got eight leaves on it. Our third wheel has got sixty three uh, uh, teeth on it, and our escape wheel has got seven leaves on it. And then our Escape wheel, like a Smith's end field, has got 41 teeth on it. Okay, so we've got an 84 tooth wheel. The numbers are irrelevant here, really. You, in your homework, you're going to make up your own numbers. 84 tooth driving an eight leaf pinion. This is sharing a common axle or arbor. We've got a 63 to seven, and then our escape wheel's got 44 uh, teeth on it. So hold that thought. Okay, and we're gonna just write this out a little bit neater here. So what we want to do first is to break, in this method, break those numbers down into ratios because gears work in ratios, okay? As an example, um, sorry, focus issues. As an example, if we've got uh, a wheel here driving, a wheel here, and this wheel has got, this wheel's got 40 teeth on it, and this one's got 10 teeth on it. They operate in a ratio of 40 to 10, or you can, uh, what do you call it in math? You can, uh, break that down, that's not the right answer, is it? Math is hopeless to simplify it to four to one. 
remember these sessions are for beginners like me who have always struggled with math. So getting your head around wheel ratios is incredibly important. One day you'll get a clock that's got a wheel missing or you might be doing this calculation. Okay, so that's what a ratio is. Oh, there we are, ratio four to one. Now let's just go back to our um, actual clock. We've got 84 and our center wheel driving um, an eight leaf pinion. So we've got an 84 to eight ratio, which you can simplify to um, 10.5 to one. Now again, 10.5 to one. Don't worry if you get these crazy numbers, you always will just count your uh, wheel teeth. Use a pencil, by the way, not a Sharpie pen when you're counting the wheel teeth. So um, the ratio between our center wheel and third wheel is 10.5 to one. We know our center wheel goes around once an hour. Yeah, hopefully everybody's with us. I think our viewing numbers have gone down to an all time low. Um, that's my challenge anyway. Uh, so we know that our third wheel goes around 10.5 times every hour. It has to do because they're meshing together. So let's do the next one, which is our third wheel, uh, which has got uh, 63 teeth on it. And that's driving our escape wheel pinion, which has got seven leaves on there. So exactly the same thing. We've got 63, two, seven, which is um, come on, brain. nine to one. Thank you. <laughs> People are shouting out there, nine to one, it's nine to one, Matthew. Can't you do that in your head? Nine to one, right, okay. So we have got this driving this. Those two are connected by the arbor. We've got this driving this. So to figure out how many times this goes round in relation to this, we multiply those uh, ratios together. So um, whatever 10.5 times nine is, my calculator, 94.5. So for every time our, our hand goes round once, our escape wheel, goes round 94.5 times. Gosh, where is this going, you might ask. Um, anyway, we might get back to some actual clock making next week. Um, so we've got escape wheel goes on 94.5 times. Now we remember our escape wheel has got 44 teeth on it. So for every hour, 44 teeth go past our, go through our escapement. 94 and a half times. So if we multiply that number by 44 teeth, uh, I've got all this written down somewhere here. We get, I think it's 4,158, 4,158. Maybe um, you can see why I'm not a math teacher. I should have probably started at the top of the page and worked my way down. <laughs> be really cool if anybody out there runs a youtube channel please redo this in a uh, comprehensible way so what we now know for every hour one rotation of our our hand minute hand sorry 4158 teeth go through our escapement okay but that doesn't help us that much because remember our pendulum our escapement ticks twice for every tooth. We're not talking about an oscillation as in physics. We're talking about a clockmaker's pendulum oscillation where we count from one side to the other, not the full oscillation. So in order to get the actual number of ticks per hour, and I think if you've got one of those beat book things, this is probably what it tells you. We have to multiply that by two, which gives us a bigger number, 8,316. So we have 8,316 ticks per hour. So that's your homework, okay? Make up your own numbers and do that calculation because this number here 
is going to give you your pendulum length or theoretical pendulum length as well. So let's just do that last little bit. So we've got, I'll try to start at the top, 8,316. I'll call it tick per hour. Presumably, if I'm going completely wrong here, somebody would have said by now, and or maybe they're just sat there smoking a big cigar and laughing. Anyway, I don't blame you. Okay, so um, that, again, isn't quite going to help us enough. We'll call this N, so number, okay? So N is anyway, ticks per hour. Um, if we want to find out how many ticks per second that relates to, we need to divide by 60 to get from hours to minutes and then divide by 60 again. So I uh, lost my bit of paper. It's just easier to do it again. 8316 divided by 3600 equals 2.31. So divided by 60 divided by 60 equals 2.31 right we are getting somewhere we have got 2.31 ticks uh per second for pendulum length we want to know the duration of one of those ticks so to turn it from number of ticks per second to duration of a tick we get the inverse of that and the way you do that and this was a complete revelation to me when i first learned how to do this is you put one, whoops, one, number one, over N, which equals one over 2.31, which equals, I've got it written down, one divided by two, equals 0 0.432900. So one over 432900. Just check that's right. One divided by point four three two nine hundred and some other numbers after that. So we are getting there. Um, we now know that for that train count, our the duration of one tick. So from our pendulum moving from one side to the other, basically, are making half an oscillation as it would in physics. That's going to take us about point four three two of a second. Okay, so we're nearly there, we're nearly there, and I think we're nearly out of time as well, so that's <laughs> that's quite convenient. Uh, so it looks good so far. Right, okay, um, great. This uh, will one day be useful, I hope, to at least one person. It's been really useful to me, so what can I say? So now what we need to do is we need to take that number and turn it into our pendulum length. Now, um, let me just get this uh, right. So uh, first thing first is we're going to call this T, small t, okay? So the time between ticks. Now, I'm not using big T like this, as a physicist or a mathematician might use, because big T means a complete, well, not a completely different thing, but a different thing. That relates to one full oscillation, which is a pendulum starting in the middle, going across to one side, going across to the side and back to the middle, a kind of, uh, if I get this right, um, sine wave thing like that. We're only interested in half that value as a clock maker. Okay, so T is 0.32900 or thereabouts. If you go on the internet or any uh, theory book about pendulums, you will come across this calculation T equals two pi root L over G. Okay, you may have seen that. If you're a mathematician, you will know this really well. Um, if you might remember it from school, it was a heck of a long time for me. And as you probably gather, I was staring out of the window at more interesting stuff going on outside and not looking at what the teacher was telling me. Um, you can, what we've got here is T, so that's that full oscillation. Uh, equals two pi square root of L is the length of the pendulum uh, divided by the value of gravity acceleration due to gravity. Now you can see here that this isn't particularly useful for us because we already know what T is, or at least we know what, if we get rid of that, we know what small T is. What we wanna know is what L is. 
So um, going even more off piece next week, we believe it or not, with the help of John, where's John when you need him, are going to rearrange this equation. But in the meantime, to get you underway with your homework, I'm going to show you a nice clocky cheat way of doing it. And that is this, this uh, equation. You might have seen this um, in books, and that is L. So L is a subject to be uh, the equation, which is what we want, equals, I think it's 994. This is in metric, by the way, T squared. S a simplified and probably much frowned on, but incredibly useful equation when we've got uh, our T value here. Um, so the length of the pendulum in millimeters, that's why we've got 994 here. If you want it in inches, uh, you can put uh, 39.14 uh, there inches, that's millimeters. Um, now this is making the presumption that we've got some standardized acceleration due to gravity, which of course we don't. For us clocks people, like domestic clocks, we take that at 9.8 meters per second per second. But as you probably know, acceleration due to gravity changes in any particular place and it changes wherever you are on the um, on the planet. So if you are good at math and you're going to do the homework, and I hope you're all going to do the homework, if you want an extension exercise, I want you to figure out the length of a second pendulum for acceleration due to gravity where you live. And you can find that on the internet and it'll be slightly different. We will be checking. Right, okay, so in our closing minutes, we're gonna figure out from our clock, remember all those painful moments before when we wrote down those wheel uh, counts, what the pendulum length's gonna be given a standard acceleration due to gravity. So we know what T is here. It's point, uh, 0 0.432, let's just call it 432, three significant figures. Uh, so let's square that, 0.432, so that's um, 0 0.18, we'll call it 0 0.186. So T squared is 0 0.186, we're going to multiply that by 994, and it gives us a pendulum length, ta-da, of 185 millimeters. Okay, shouldn't have a dot there, 185 millimeters, um, and let's divide that by 25.4, 7.3 inches. Okay, oops, you can see it there. So, wow, that was a bit of, um, bit of an uphill struggle, but hopefully will be of some use to somebody at some point. So go through it as an exercise. If like me, you struggle a bit with math and weren't concentrating and didn't do your times tables, start by getting your clock, just make up the numbers. You don't have to count a real clock, just make up the numbers, center wheel, third wheel, escape wheel, three numbers for those wheels, third wheel pinion and escape wheel pinion, two numbers for those. Write them down like this, work out the ratios, and then you might have to watch this video and it will be up online if it's been recording. And they'll just very quickly in the closing minutes. Um, Derek says, is the pendulum length overall, including the bob? No, as I said, uh, Derek, this is the theoretical length it's gonna give you. So it's a kind of distance between the point, the center of oscillation, wherever that squishy spring bending thing is, and the center of mass of the pendulum as well. So your actual real pendulum in this case, I think is always gonna be longer than the theoretical length, but it gets you in the ballpark to start with. If you don't wanna go through all that fuss, you can write this down much more simply, and that's to put the wheels, which is 84, times 63 times 44 times two. So we've got center wheel, third wheel, escape wheel, multiply that two because we our pendulum makes two ticks per, um, per uh, oscillation. 
and then divide that whole thing by the number of leaves on the pinion, which is eight by seven. That's a multiplied sign, eight by seven. And then we need to multiply that by 60 by 60 to get from hours to seconds. So if you multiply those together, multiply those together, divide that by that, you will come up with the same answer. I did it uh, before to double, triple check. I think the kind of graphic way of drawing it works better for me because I can't always remember what these actual numbers mean. So there we are. Uh, I promise it won't be like this every week. <laughs> we'll go back to um, clock repairing next week. So by next week, I'm gonna have that spring all cleaned up, back in the barrel, the movement put back together, relubricated, and we're gonna put it in the case and set the clock in beat. We will have gone through the live chat, I think. Yeah, we're getting a nod from the corner and figured out what our best uh, top three tools for beginners are. And I will want to know from you, and I'll be asking what uh, the length of a seconds pendulum is for the local gravity uh, acceleration due to gravity wherever you live. And it'd be also cool to figure out who's got the most gravity where they live. I don't quite know what that means. Anyway, I'm sure it means something. Um, thank you to Team Open Clock Club who've been typing away. Uh, thank you for bearing with us in this slightly unusual um, uh, unusual week. I really, 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 fingers crossed, hope that by next week we'll have the bushing and depthing chapter uh, on Kindle. And I'm going to go through it with you, uh, not because I want to sell the things. Book publishing is a really quick way to go bankrupt, I've discovered, but because there might be things in there that are actually of use to you. And there's some quite sort of um, controversial things as well, of course, as always. Um, so keep up on the Facebook. We're up to about 400 members now, which is really cool. We've got some nice comments on YouTube videos, which I don't get around to doing at the moment, but I will uh, get back to them. And please let us know on Facebook if there's a particular subject you want us to discuss, uh, discuss even in these sessions. So beautiful weekend ahead here, holiday weekend. Um, if you're working, as we will be as well a little bit, uh, then have a great week. Hope to see you on Thursday for the live stream where we're continuing our pivoting, slightly disastrous pivoting operation. Uh, see you on Facebook. And if not, then we will see you next Saturday for the 28th, I think it is, Open Clock Club. Thanks very much. I'll leave the live chat open for a few minutes for people to say goodbye. Thanks for joining us.